And we're back. With some more oxygen not included. And before we get on with the uh, the main build of the day, there's this side project we're taking care of. We've brought back a whole bunch of salt water. Well, salt water and brine. The salt water, of course, is to feed some of our crops down here on our one kilo of methane per second base, which seems to be working out quite nicely. Now, we don't need the actual brine, so we're just pouring that into the background of space. Also acts as a bit of a coolant, thankfully. But the salt water, yes, we are going to need that, and that's going to come down here. That salt water is going to go down there and into that liquid tank. As that liquid tank fills up, it should flip that from a green to a red, so that will stop this rocket from launching again. Plus, the rocket can't launch until it's been refueled, and it won't get a... Uh, the green signal won't be allowed to activate it until the liquid tank is empty. That automation signal should flip there just now. Perfect. This is no longer going to launch, and we've brought back enough water that we shouldn't need to relaunch this again for another... Well, that's about 300 cycles on average per launch. I'm thinking the duplicate's going to be quite happy with that. Well, okay, maybe not super happy. This place is, uh, yes, it's incredibly cold and they can't breathe because they're in their atmo suit. But we could put in doors to change them in and out of their atmo suit, but that might actually just complicate things. I like that this thing works and we don't have to worry about it. As for the Bleachstone one, yeah, we're not going to be launching that probably for another, oh, I don't know, four or five thousand cycles. So we're pretty safe on that front as well. That leads us to the next step. I'm going to take our construction teams back home. We've got we've got a, a very, very interesting problem to solve next. Back on our home planet, things have been going rather well. Everything here has not exploded, basically. So we've been able to get good maintenance done here without actually doing anything, and we've been sending all of the resources we need via these cannons over to other planets that actually require them. But this is going to be where we're going to be spending our time today. We're going to turn these into colonization rockets, and uh, not how you think. Let's just uh, rip apart some of these bits first. Instead of refitting these, we're actually going to just get rid of them entirely. Uh, that will become clear in a second why. Oh, and there was a duplicate in there. We have dispatched those two duplicates over to the other planet. They've already landed and taken up their jobs at Forging in Progress, which I should probably rename, uh, but we're still one person shy. They're up to six. Actually, no, they can get two more people. We should ship over two more people at some point. This whole thing is working out quite nicely. They're up to like 340,000 calories of Frostburger. I think that place is going to work out quite well. Now this next bit, I'm not going to lie, this next bit's going to be weird. This is, uh... Yeah, I've been spending way too long getting ready for this next bit because I just discovered this recently and then I had to do a whole bunch of testing on the side. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say uh, Cobalt is fine, is it? Yeah, let's just go with Cobalt. Now if you just hit build, what will happen is you can put down a spacefarer module. And that is basically the that's the that that's when your ship gets named. Until the one goes down, you don't get a name. However, if you say select this and then you say spacefarer module, and then you know what? Let's uh, let's double click really fast. Oh, no, damn it. Alright, one more time, but we're gonna put the speed on max so the game's uh, running a little bit slower. And there you go. We've accidentally made well, accidentally on purpose made two spacefarer modules on a rocket and nope damn it missed that one just just give me a minute we can get these it's pure vanilla behavior yes you're not supposed to be able to do it but it's going to give us some funny options some very funny options oh do yourself a favor when you're doing this remember to delete the little ladder tiles that were getting in the way of the uh the little transport or the uh, space fair module you were trying to build makes things a little bit earlier to double click there we go done uh, and if we look over here on the right how are we looking you got cargo rust and cargo rust so we actually have two cargo rust modules that is strange yeah and this is just the tip of the strangeness iceberg this gets weirder as we go along i've been playing around with this in the background it's why this episode is so horrifically late was just trying to figure out how to use this and how to get them to work because there's some strange things uh all right, first up this is what the interior looks like. In fact, the interior interiors are identical, but they're completely separate. So we can build inside both of these. No problems. However, uh, there is a problem with the ports. See, this is uh, the input port for liquids. But this import for this module and this import for this module, they're both the same. So if we start pumping clean water in there, it can be accessed inside both modules. However, if we try and, say, pump out clean water and polluted water, or just say we tried to pump out clean water out of this top module and polluted water out of this bottom module, They'll both mix and match across both the pipes, as in the pipes basically overlap with each other. Uh, it's very weird. And yes, I'm aware we should not be doing this. Yes, this is going to make our game incredibly unstable. But you know what? I've tested it and they can take off and they can land. 
So we're going to build a base inside these six, like a, a methane, one kilo per second methane base inside these six modules. And then we're going to fly it to another planet, land on it, and then like, you know, we can deconstruct all the rest of the bits and just m leave it as a base. It'll be like a, a mobile base base. I don't know. People come up with better names than me. All right. Uh, first, though, we got to rename these. Well, never mind. Turns out you can't actually rename the... You can rename one of them, but you can't rename both of them. Only the primary one or something. So we could rename these, but that's just going to make it more confusing. Instead, we'll just leave the names the way they are. All right, you. You are going to be power. In fact, we're going to deconstruct the rocket control station. If we're launching these, things get even weirder as well. You only need one rocket control station to launch them. Um, that took a while to figure out. But you do need two crew members. So to launch this, you need one rocket control station in one of them, let's say the top one, and then a crew member in each module. Then you can launch them. Without both of those criteria fulfilled, it won't work. And you have to have all your other things done, like, you know, uh, cargo loaded, fueled up, all that stuff as well. Gets, um, gets interesting. So let's deconstruct all of these rocket control modules and hope it doesn't crash the game. Because, you know, sometimes when you deconstruct those, things just break for no apparent reason. Give me, an, uh, give me another minute here. One thing to note about this is only the top spacefare module can be accessed at any one time. So, for example, if you're building something in this top module, you can't, no duplicates can enter this module. That's going to make things interesting, but it just adds to the building joy. Yep, just adds to it. Makes it so much nicer. So we've got to make sure that when we land these, it's completely operational without having to swap the modules around. It's going to hurt my brain, something shocking. Okay, right, but... First things first, we're just going to put in a power brick here. we got to burn off the natural gas that's coming in, so yeah, give me one minute. There we go. That looks like a really super simple, easy power brick. It'll, don't worry, it'll start making more sense as it goes along. Not a lot more sense, mind you, but a little bit more. This thing has, uh, I thought the last base fried my noodle, trying to build one inside rockets where they share ports and, oh, yep, never mind. You, you'll see as we go. This is going to be, uh, yeah, this is going to be one of those rough days. So, we may have accidentally left the oxygen pipes connected. You see, whenever our duplicates would land, uh, we had them trapped in the rockets, they were consuming the oxalite, and the oxalite was, well, that was causing problems for us. So instead, what we did was, we hooked up, oh god, I don't, rockets are red. What we would do is we would hook up oxygen pipes to them, and we would pump oxygen each, into each capsule so they weren't consuming the oxalite, and instead, no one would have to go in and actually replace the oxalite that they were using up. Unfortunately, we kind of pumped it into these things and uh, caused element damage to all of the natural gas generators. But that's okay. That's okay. We've cleared out the pipes. And on the bright side, it's oxygenated the place up. There's a, now a bunch of oxygen in these capsules, which will help transfer heat or something. You know what? It's 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 fine. I can we, we can live with this. I think this is a perfect moment to show you how the gas ports work. Or, well, all the ports on this thing. As you can see, we're pumping gas all the way along here into that insulated gas pipe. And that is going into this spacefarer module. And if we check in here, we can see it's actually a little bit shy. There should be more gases there, but it's not happening. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the module just above it. And if we look in there, you'll see that one's getting oxygen as well. The two of them share the gas port. Yeah, we're because of the way we're doing this and over and putting in two modules, even though you shouldn't have them, it basically treats both of those input ports as if they're the same and same with the output output ports. I'm surprised it doesn't crash the game. But it does allow us to, well, double stack the modules, which is kind of entertaining. We could do the same thing we're trying to do right now, but we'd have to make about six rockets. Doing it with three seems more reasonable. Plus, it's sort of the rule of cool. This is an exploit. They will patch it out at some point. But for now, we can do something nice. This next bit is going to be, um, yeah, this is going to be our food compartment. Now, it makes no sense right now, but, uh, we're putting in a bunch of nuclear waste. We're going to need some rads. We want to be growing some uh, radioactive plants. So we're going to need a whole bunch of rads for that. Which means we're going to need about 2,500 kilos of nuclear waste that's been solidified. That's going to be a little bit tricky, but we're going to compress a whole bunch of it in here. And what is that? Oh, wow. Nuclear waste is escaping out of that. I, I didn't know that was a thing. Okay, then. So... Right, pipe is blocked. Why is the pipe blocked? Oh, yeah. This thing. And we'll reset that. I want to make sure we use exactly enough nuclear waste and nothing more. So it's going to be two and a half tons. Oh, for getting that nuclear waste in, uh, what we've done is we've attached on a liquid cargo tank, filled it, and we started loading nuclear waste in through here. So we've actually got a liquid port loader. 
and this comes along here and starts filling up this liquid cargo tank which is attached to the top of the rocket. Then inside the rocket we use uh, a liquid output filter to move the liquids in here and dump them into the section. There's some handy things you can do with those input and output filters that's going to make making our little mobile base handier while also simultaneously harder. Uh. To get this stuff to actually solidify, we're going to need to cool it a lot. Now we could have ran piping through here and done a whole bunch of fancy stuff. Instead, we're, we're just going to use a bunch of temperature shift plates. Uh, temperature shift plates will drag some temperature out of it and then the water down here interacts with the temperature shift plate and it dumps chill into it diagonally. Uh, we wait until the water gets a little bit warm and once the water warms up a bit, we cycle that and get new stuff. There is far more efficient ways we could have done this, but we have lots and lots of ice on this planet. Just so much. How much ice we got? We got... Uh, that's... 358 tons of ice. I can't even remember how we got our hands on that much ice. Some of it might have come from space. All right, but just to, to recap here, we've got large power module in this top capsule. We've got slightly smaller power module in this one. This is so that we can stick in a rocket control station so that rocket can take off. This is sort of a flying power module. Then over here, we've got the final power module. This is four more. So we're only going to have 11 natural gas generators, but that should be sufficient for what we're doing. And we even got a little mini pump down here and a, a sensor. So that when it's full or when uh, the water pressure gets high enough, by that I mean 50 kgs down here in the bottom, all of that water is pumped out. It's going to exchange heat all the way up until it gets pumped out the top of the capsule. That's how all of them work. So what we need to remember is this capsule, th these four capsules here are all going to have natural gas being fed into them. So yeah, also their output, liquid outputs on all of these are all going to be outputting polluted water. Which brings us on to this spacefare module. This one here, any, if we output water out of this, it's going to get mixed in with the polluted water and we can't bring in any gases. So we can only output, we can, oh, actually no, we can't output gases either, carbon dioxide is going to go. We can output water. We can output water through here, otherwise we've got to dump it into storage tanks attached to it. So the only thing we can pump out of here is, is a liquid, I think. Oh, great. Oh, that's going to make things confusing. Then over here, we've got these two modules. This one here is going to be for cooling. This is a steam turbine. This is an aqua tuner. We've got ourselves a cooling loop. I'll go through more on this once I've sort of figured it out, but I think I think we're close, we're close. And then down here we have the actual living quarters. Uh, this is going to be very similar to our previous ones. We're going to have a, a nice little comfy bedroom for them down there, though I do have to put in a decor item. But uh, yeah, that is the guts of the plan. Just give me another few minutes and we should have hopefully most of it done. I think our nuclear waste is finally about to hit its freeze point. 26.9 minus 3 is about 23.9. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but... You ice temperature shift plates should help out. Assuming, yeah, they'll melt in a bit, and then we'll throw in a few more. I think, yeah, another couple of ice temperature shift plates after those two should solve the problem. Oh, oh, there we go, there we go. Solid nuclear waste. Perfect, I'll chill it down just a little bit more before we take the top off it. Uh, you use airflow tiles because they don't take pressure damage. If we had used normal tiles, they might have, um, they might have broken because of the pressure of all that nuclear waste compressed in there. All right, that gives us a really good source of rads inside this area so that we can run some crops. We only need to run two bristle blossoms to support one duplicate. That's all we're going for. We're not going too crazy with this one. Actually, we can cancel that now. Uh, yeah, that's going to be well cold enough. That gets that almost ready to start. So that's what's that going to look like when it's finished. We're going to have clean water coming in there and feeding those two crops. And those two crops should be nicely radiated. 260 rads, 260. They just need 250, so that should be fine. And it's already pressurized up to 2 kilos of oxygen. We're not going to be adding or subtracting any more gases. Anyone coming in here wearing an Atmos suit. So, I was thinking we should probably start doing some testing. So, over here we've got our normal setup for collecting methane from space. We're going to go over to our Aku Texas, and we're going to start firing over some methane to our home planet to get turned into methane to at least prep the system. Uh, there's already three guns firing, so say hello to number four. Well, there is our first 200 kilos of methane. That can start getting loaded up in there. Oh, yeah, I, I think I set up about three shells to be fired in rapid succession, so we'd have, yeah, plenty of methane to get us started. Perfect. That's all going to get rotated around. What have we got that set to? It should be set to one kilo. Excellent. Go on. Melt. 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 Or do, exit. Okay, done. Any of that gonna... Where's the rest of it? How did I mess that up? Ah, yes, I forgot to put in the automation wire. Because I'm an idiot. Never mind. 
All right, once that's started, though, we're going to need to chill it down a little bit in here. It's too warm. I need some cold methane. Otherwise, we can't pump it into the power bricks. Otherwise, they'll overheat. We're depending on the methane to cool the power bricks. You'll not, you see, we can't run anything, any cooling loops through here, because if you run liquid through here, it also has to run through the bottom layer. And since we've got three power bricks, it gets kind of uneven. For example, this one here, we'd have to run then a cooling loop through this, and then it gets awkward. So instead, instead, we're just going to do use the methane to come in to cool the power bricks and keep everything stable. And there we go. That should be next layer. Yeah, nice. So when we've got 20 kilos of this stuff, we'll just start dumping it out into space for a little bit until we get some cooling. And then we're going to start dumping it into the power bricks. I'm thinking that's about the right temperature. It's okay. It's 15 degrees, which is a far cry from the minus 80 I want to eventually hit. But I think we can start plugging that in now. I'll just hook that up there. Quick snips and off you go. And to plug this into these systems, oh, second, uh, this one here is a power brick, this one here is a power brick, and this one here is a power brick. Let me just double check those. So this one here, yep, all looks perfectly fine and dandy. Uh, oh, let's make sure there's nothing hooked up to the gas ports in here. That would be awkward. Yep, there's, there's nothing hooked up to the gas ports there. That's fine. And then these two over here should also be the same way. I don't want to make sure we're not messing any of this up because if we have to dismantle these and put them back together, I don't think my brain can take it. This has been a really weird jigsaw puzzle. It, it feels a lot like the mini base series I did a long time ago. All right, let's see. Okay. And in here, if we check, that's going to make its way around and hopefully drag down the temperature. It has like a 48 degree. Yes, yeah, so it's effectively shedding all its heat almost instantly. But that's fine. The more natural gas we pump in here, the cooler this will get over time. So we're going to let this run for a bit. Now, right now, for outputs on those, these are all outputting polluted water. The polluted water is going to get shunted up through here and dumped out that liquid vent. That way we can keep an eye and see what temperature the polluted water is coming out at. I'd like to drive it down a bit before we start using it or just make sure that everything's running stable. Then, next up, there is the gases from it. All of them are going to be outputting carbon dioxide. You can actually see it coming out there. Carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide. These two are going to be mix, mix matched between each other, but they should still both be working. And if we've done it right, none of them should overheat. Well, we also made them of steel as well, which is a good thing. Uh, Gases-wise, we've pressurized them in oxygen well above the 10 kilo mark in, in all three of them. So we shouldn't get any polluted water off-gassing, and I think, I think we're golden. Uh, heat, heat is definitely a bit hot, but give it some time. Now, with those three, I know this is really hard to keep track of, but just remember, these three here are power plants, and those three are now active. What we want to get around to is water boiling. What we're going to do is we're going to dump the polluted water in here. That polluted water will get boiled. That boiled polluted water will get chilled. And then the chilled clean water will then get fed to our crops is the plan. So first we've got to... Oh, actually... What we can do now is disconnect this from the uh, the power we had we were bringing in from over here. Uh, get rid of that there. And you'll notice that is a heavy watt conductive wire. You have to use heavy watt conductive wire because you got to remember, this is all one grid. We can't just plug in normal wire there because then we'd be carrying the power from multiple natural gas generators. And the moment we go over two kilowatts somewhere, anywhere, it, it's all going to break down. It gets really confusing. So we just have to use heavy watt wire everywhere. There's no exceptions. Unless we put down a transformer first, which is kind of what we did, we're going to do in here because we've got to run this aqua tuner and this tepid this what i'm going to start running this and then try and explain it because honestly i don't think my brain can do it <laughs> normally i can like build these and at least try and explain what i'm thinking but I, I can't do it anymore this is just this one hurts too much all right so i'm i'm gonna plug this one in and we're gonna start dumping in the polluted water and i think i think i can explain it i, I don't make any promises here because i'm still not sure i get it myself because this is all right, so the three power plants over here, 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 and here, they are now pumping out the polluted water. They're, uh, they've hit the 50 kilo mark inside there just so it's nice and stable, and then all that polluted water is going to get shunted down here into this end. Now, one thing to remember, while this here is where we're going to be boiling and cooling water, just below it in this capsule, which shares the same liquid inputs and outputs, is the living quarters. So we need to make sure not to start cross-contaminating between the two, these two. It would be awkward. Anyway, polluted water is going to come in here. It's going to flow down the section. Come on, there you go. It's going to pass through a reed fiber plant because we need to go reed fiber for our Atmos suits. Uh, yeah, we're just going to straight up feed a full timber reed. That's going to cost us a lot of polluted water, but, but we're really tight on space, and this is this is 
the only place I could think of where we could put it where we can keep the temperature at a reasonable amount. You see, we need to keep the temperature of this around 22 to 37. And I kind of want to keep this separate from our crop area because if we, well, if we try to go to the thimble reed with the rest of our crops, if we go above 26.9 or something like that, we might melt the nuclear waste and that would be bad. This whole system is not perfect. It's, it's, it's just going to work, hopefully. Anyway, in here. This thermal sensor detects if the temperature goes below 124. And uh, what's the polluted water at? The polluted water is at... That boils at 119. So this means it just, just keeps hot enough to keep boiling the polluted water. We don't care about the dirt. Yeah, I, I I was trying to figure out some way to extract the dirt, but we are so cramped on space in here. It's incredible. Like, I couldn't even fit in a large power transformer with this here. Like, to keep this heat sealed, we couldn't let it touch the metal sides. This whole thing is a steel box. So if any of the steam touches that, well, there goes our heat seal. So we sealed in the whole thing around the edges. And then that means we only have three tiles to the side. Fortunately, to still be serviceable and get the reed fiber, we could only have two tiles of width, which meant we put in two small power transformers. <laughs> so the two small power transformers can provide enough power to run the thermo aqua tuner. Otherwise, we would have had to do a vacuum seal. Never mind. It works, generates a bit of heat, and you'll notice that right here, it's about 25 degrees, but on the opposite side, it's about 19 degrees. Now, can't promise that's going to last forever. We're, we're still doing... We're still... This is very much a, a beta test. Down here, this is set to 15 degrees. That's also set to 15 degrees. We were trying to keep this as cool as possible. But every time we dump in more polluted water, this means this has to keep activating. Uh, then when the pressure in here, the steam pressure in here goes above 20 kilos, what it does is it sends an automation signal up to the shutoff. And that shutoff turns off, which means the excess water, as in the polluted water that gets shunted in, turns into steam, that will get sent down here. And it comes out hot, but then immediately starts to cool down and as it goes around the outside edge. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, well, pretty simple. This stuff comes at, at 95. These are diamond tiles. These are also steel tiles, and it's all touching this pool of super coolant where we're dumping all the chill. Oh, okay, so that stuff cools down, and it gets to about here, we put it back into insulated pipes. The reason being we don't want to get too cold, otherwise we'll stifle the reed fiber, and then we won't have reed fiber for our suits. Uh, actually, put a tile there. In my original design on the test map, this was actually going off into a st liquid storage tank, but never mind, that was that was a different build. So now this comes across here, and it comes out at about 19C, which is actually perfect. Let's let that run for 5 to 10 cycles to make sure it's stable, though, before we commit. I don't want to dump that in with our nuclear waste uh, crop plant area. Otherwise, we could end up with problems, because, you know, we might accidentally boil something if something goes wrong. So for now, that's just coming out this pipe, and that clean water is getting dumped there. Now just to give you an idea of some of the problems we face next, we have to use that clean water in both of these modules, which is both good and bad. For example, in this module, we can just pump it straight in. We can literally run a pipe down here and dump it in, but we can't with this one, because if we try and run it into this module, we also got to worry about the polluted water that's coming in here would also split and end up merging in that, and we need that clean water to run the toilets. So instead, what we're going to have to do is attach a liquid storage tank to this, pump liquid into the storage tank through one of these, and then extract the liquid in here using a liquid output fitting. Don't want to turn that on just yet. That generates heat, and I'm not sure if we can handle the heat from that, but theoretically, we should. For now, though, the next thing we're going to work on is oxygen and plants. So this is probably the weirdest electrolyzer setup, and you probably have a few questions, and I will be more than happy to answer them once I figure them out myself. It's time to turn this module on. What we need to do here is pump in a bunch of cold water and take out a bunch of gases and, well, crops as well. So, water activate. Uh, you can be severed and done. Now the water will start to flow. What we've learned here just from watching this for a while, water comes out at about 20 degrees. We're able to get a stable 20 degrees C water coming out of here. At the same time, this place remains warm enough for the thimble reed to grow. Downside though, just realized I need access to both these modules at all times. This one you need to get in to get the reed fiber. And the one below it is actually the living capsule. But uh, this also results in the problem that this space fair module here also needs to be accessible because it's bristle blossoms. So do I have to strap a power plant on top of all three of these? And uh, You know what? We're going to worry about that later when my brain hurts less. Uh, for now, water comes in here and it's set to... Uh, well, distribute its heat as it goes through, so that way it should keep all the crops in this area chilled, no matter how much heat gets generated in here. Uh, we're not going to generate... Uh, you know what? Let's get this started. Uh, give me the heavy wet wire, please. Plug that sucker in, and electrolyzer kicks on. And you might be wondering, 
why are we kicking on the electrolyzer? Well, how are we going to sort the gases from this? Turns out, not as difficult as you would think. All you have to do, let's see, hook this up, cancel that. It's all gonna, it's gonna rip out hydrogen and oxygen. It doesn't care, this gas pump's just gonna rip it all out. It's the smallest setup I could come up with. Well, we could have removed the corners, I suppose. Then what happens is it comes down through here, rotates through these pipes, and it should, if we've done this right, shed more heat. Well, the incoming water will bring in more heat than uh, this is producing, so it should keep the whole thing at a stable temperature. If not, that nuclear waste is going to become a huge problem. Anyway, this is a gas intake fitting. What this does is allow all of those gases to get shunted directly into an attached gas storage tank, and it doesn't care what's in them. We haven't even designated filters, and we can see that this thing has hydrogen and oxygen collecting in it. Excellent. In fact, it's like a built-in sorter, though it does cost us a lot of power. About, ooh, 480 watts of power, but that's okay. Remember, we have uh, 11 natural gas generators powering this whole build. Not a big deal. We just go into unbreathable gases, select hydrogen, and... Boom. All the hydrogen we're collecting is now being ripped out of that storage tank and dumped into outer space. Sorting problem? Sort it! Then this one here, we're going to get unbreathable gas or breathable gases and give us some oxygen. And then the oxygen's going to get the oxygen. Hey, oh yeah, I have to actually hook that up, don't I? One second. And then the oxygen's going to get sorted out this section and get sent up to that module. See, we can do all our gas sorting externally, sort of, using a gas tank. Now all we have to do is let this run for a bit, because, well, I'm not sure how stable it is temperature-wise and all that. We want to make sure there is no hor horrific explosions, and, oh, this place has already been gassed up. That's fine. It's fine for now. Oh, actually, we can disable that hand sanitizer. Uh, yep. And, yeah, give it about, oof, let's give this about five or six cycles just to make sure everything remains stable and that we don't accidentally pop this uh, solid waste. I'm going to have to keep a close eye on this. I, I don't want to jinx us. I don't want to jinx us, but the solid waste is actually getting colder. So I think we've got, I've even turned on the temperature bit of the water coming in, so now it's coming in at about 16 to 18 degrees. Come on, give me another batch of water. Or we're even let it uh, accumulate some more. And I think I've got an idea about how to fix our thimble reed problem combined with uh, its location. So we don't want two modules that you need to access simultaneously on one rocket because sometimes the game glitches out on that. We want to keep the w only one module accessible at a time, probably the top one. I think the top one is the one that seems to work the most. This is all a bit glitchy and we're in weird glitchy land, but what we can do with that is we can, instead of growing the thimble reed in here where we've been growing it, I was thinking, what if we just dedicate a whole power module to it? Like, in here, we only have three natural gas generators. If we take all of the polluted water that is generating and just grow a thimble reed in here, we'd have to do some fiddling around with temperature and stuff like that, but I think it could work. All we do is we'd put, say, a thimble reed right here, have it grow up, and have all the polluted water from this section dumped right into it. Now, we would have to make sure that, say, all of this uh, thermium gas piping doesn't dump in enough chill to stifle it and bring the temperature too low, but I think that would work. In fact, okay, we'll delete the rocket station, put it in a, a little block to stop the water escaping, and then change that to a thimble reed tile. Before we go hooking up this thimble reed, though, I do want to try and get a little bit of a backlog of water in the system. You see, one of the problems we face is, well, this giant gas car cargo canister. This is the smallest one you can build. Problem is, it doesn't actually limit it. We can limit this to whatever size we want, but if we keep trying to put in gases from inside the rocket, it just keeps filling it and filling it and filling it. So until this hits, what is it, 3.6 tonnes of oxygen, we're going to just, yeah, we're, we're going to have problems with this. As in, this will never stop running, which means this electrolyzer will still keep consuming water and we'll just have to keep feeding it. So one thing I would like to do while we're doing that is I'm uh, overflowing some of the excess water down here and putting it into this water loader, which then goes into this liquid tank, which gives us one kilo of water. I'm going to set it to one kilo for now which is attached to our living module, which is in here, which means we can now hook this up. Uh, actually, the power is off on that one, isn't it? Damn it. All right. We can now hook that up. Should then start the water flowing uh, one kilo at a time, but that's fine. It'll quickly fill that sucker up. And that goes into that toilet. We're actually just going to vent the water into space. We've got this oh, space that was dropping on the launch pad. It's not very hygienic, I know, but technically it doesn't end up there. It's just it's just going to vanish, you know? D don't worry about the mechanics. Don't think about it too hard. And 
Done. Now we could have set that to 10 kilos in the liquid tank, but I just wanted to see if this was possible. And it really allows us to meter that in a very fine amount. The thing I'm curious about though is once this is fill up, as in once this backs up in the pipe all the way to here, will this thing keep generating heat? No, it does not. That's actually good because if you leave this here with no water in it, for some reason it keeps trying to pump water out and it just, you know, never mind causes problems. That means we can keep that running. The water will back up in that pipe system. In fact, we're just going to set you to 10 kilos. Yeah, you can go to 10. And done, we have 10 kilos of water in there. That water will back up in the system up to that point. Once it backs up to about there, I think I'll turn on the reed fiber. And at that point, I think we can call the system stable. I'd, I'd need to let it run for another 50, 60 cycles to be 100% sure, but we, we've got everything we need. As in, once we plug in the water from this into that, we'll be using three natural gas generators worth of polluted water to keep that running. That should provide us more than enough reed fiber to make our Atmos suits. Inside here, we've actually got the exosuit forge. We'll put the reed fiber in there and we'll repair our Atmos suits. We've got two exuberant bristle blossoms here, which are heavily mutated. These things grow four times faster than normal bristle blossoms, but we use 50% more fertilizer, meaning you get just way more plant for your water. And that is, yeah, we've got plenty of water to keep them growing at full speed. And oxygen wise, yes, we can definitely keep an entire duplicate going. In fact, I'm kind of curious, um, not right now, but I'm pretty sure you could support two or three duplicates this way. Just land a fourth rocket and we can have more living quarters and more farming and this would be quite easy to expand. But no, no, just looking at the overlays, no, <laughs> no, that's insanity. But it works and it, it actually worked quite well. Okay, it's not the perfect in terms of just, you know, set and forget. You would have to land down a small build crew and you'd have to build one of these first to accept down the methane. And once the methane's down, you'd have to start running it a bit later, at least until it gets a bit colder. Otherwise, it's going to be too hot in the, the, the power plant rooms. But we have power plant, power plant, power plant. Well, okay, this power plant also does reed fiber. And where are you going? Oh, there uh, Sinatra was actually the pilot for that rocket. So three power plants, one crop area slash, uh, well, one crop area slash oxygenator slash uh, atmosphere repair. One water boiler that boils and chills the water, meaning all the polluted water gets turned into clean water. The clean water then gets turned back into cold, clean water. That cold, clean water that's, then gets into the crop area, of course. And then one living module for the duplicates to live in. And this one was actually... Hmm, this was actually a little painful to design because the duplicates going to spend a lot of time in here and we can't afford to give them rad pills. That was a bit of a problem. So what we had to do is make sure we have lots of plastic tiles up here and try and make sure they don't stand in places that are too bad. This is a little bit unfortunate. I might actually have to move that a little... No, no, I'll worry about that in a minute. So 30, 33 rads is how much radiation they're going to dispose of in the toilets. We might be able to double up their toilet breaks so they dispose of 66 per cycle. We're on, on the high difficulty. But standing here, 30 rads. Uh, standing anywhere in here at the dining table, 12 rads. When they're sleeping, 3.8 rads. So they shouldn't ever stand in this tile here, which is probably one of the worst. Uh, this tile here, I'm not really sure if there's much more we can do about that. Mm. You know what? Maybe there is something we can do to tweak that just a little. Well, while, while I was trying to take care of this, I got a warning about suffocation, which was over here, Chris was suffocating. And I was like, why can't that guy get back into his base? And uh, then I realized this is actually one of our long-term super duper cold storage rockets over on Forging in Progress. And I was wondering, wait, that guy's not supposed to be on forging in progress. That's why he can't get into the base. And then I realized there's only supposed to be about six people here. And look at that. Zap is here. Like most of those duplicates aren't supposed to be there. There's 13 duplicates on this planet, at least. That's ridiculous. They're not, but they're, they're supposed to be over. Like most of them are supposed to be on this planet. And now there's only seven people left on this planet. Somehow they magically teleported. The only thing I did was I brought this rocket back. And I used a, um, I wouldn't even call it, one of those lander things to land the duplicate back in the planet so this could, you know, navigate its own way home on autopilot. Yet somehow that managed to cause, I presume maybe the duplicates got in here and got, maybe they entered in here and then when they exited, they ended it back out on the other planet. Hmm, you know what? Doesn't matter. We, we have messed with forces we shouldn't have. Now things, duplicates are teleporting across planets without, whatever. You mess with the space-time continuum, things happen. I'm going to have to, like, get those back here somehow or is that just gonna happen again now uh i think i'm just gonna have to i, I think i'm gonna debug teleport them back because this is just too awkward otherwise we're gonna have to let them in here mess up all oh god no that's too painful we'd have to let them all back in here they, there's plenty of food we've got like six hundred thousand calories of frost burgers we don't have enough beds god I, I, I don't want this problem now <laughs> like 
I'd have to completely reorientate. I can't. I want to finish my rockets. I think since it's a bug that brought them here. Okay, true, we are exploiting a bug to make those super duper cargo rockets. But come on. We've managed to fit a one kilo per second methane base inside this. Well, okay, with that included. I think once we get these landed on a planet, we'll have to pick one. We can strip out the engines, strip out all of these. In fact, we've even got trailblazer modules on them. So we launch them into space. Then the two pilots that are in them trailblazer back down onto this planet so that, you know, they're off the rockets. And once we've got all three rockets in space, we can then autopilot them to whatever planet we want. Uh, they have a maximum range of 16 tiles, meaning they're in range of literally every planet. So we simply pick a planet, send out, say, like this one, send out a construction crew. Construction crew lands down, builds the little uh, the gas receiving module, builds three landing pads, ships land, we strip them down, put in the piping and the plumbing and the power, and then that's it. It's a perfectly mobile base that we can just land down and be done with. Of course, that's, ex that's assuming the thing doesn't crash out and die because of the insanity of having overlapping pipes and all. I'm actually kind of surprised how little it's crashed doing all of this. All right, but no, I... I I'm going to have to take care of this on the side, uh, somehow moving all of these duplicates back. Either I'm going to have to manually do it or I'm going to have to debug them. I I'm not even sure. I'm going to save it and take a break before my brain explodes. Anyway, apologies we didn't get to land this on a planet. If you've got any suggestions for which planet we should use it on, let me know. I'll, uh, I'm going to go have a very, very long cup of tea. I uh, hope you enjoyed and good luck.